inside this black circle based on the average yearly salary here in south africa it would take you three years to make 936,000 rands few thousand rands shy from 1 million rands that sounds like a big amount right it is 1 million rands after all well this is how your three years worth of hard work sweating in tears looks in comparison to the amount of money patrice mozibe is worth yes all these black circles each represent 1 million rands the world of South African billionaires is just mind-blowing. You'll be amazed to find that all these men are on the Forbes list of the wealthiest people in Africa. It may sound like bitterness, but 90% of us as the people in South Africa come from relatively poor backgrounds. My parents never cared about billionaires because they were too busy trying to make ends meet in our lives. When it's time to vote, everybody will just vote for ANC because they are afraid if change happens, then what if it happens for the worst? This is not just my story, it's not just your story either, but it's the story of many people living in South Africa. Whether you are a foreign national or a citizen most of us share the same story so let's go on this journey together and try to find the answers where is all the wealth going and why does less than five percent of the population hold 80 percent of the country's wealth yes you heard that right they hold 80 percent of the country's wealth What is plutocracy? Plutocracy is a government controlled exclusively by the wealthy, either directly or indirectly. A plutocracy allows either openly or by circumstance only the wealthy to rule. This can then result in policies exclusively designed to assist the wealthy, which is reflected in its name. The Greek words Plutus and Kratos translate to wealthy and power respectively. This video you are watching is going to open your eyes to the influence wealthy individuals and wealthy families have on the political stance of your state or your country. We live in times where nations states are governed in shadows by plutocrats or some are even governed publicly by, by those same plutocrats. I'm sure by now you all should know how wealthy this man Johan Rupert actually is. A few days ago I received a notification stating that Rupert has become the richest man in Africa after surpassing Aliko Dangote. So believe me when I say this man is filthy rich. A while ago it was alleged that he gave President Cyril Ramaphosa a marching order instructing him to fire Ace Mahashule during the time when Ace was ANC Secretary General and going through a very huge scandal. According to a highly placed source within Ramaphosa's camp, who spoke to the Daily News, Rupert allegedly summoned Ramaphosa, former Deputy Finance Minister Mkwebi C. Jonas, and Old Mutual Chairman Trevor Manuel, and told them that if Mahashule was not removed on that very week by the National Executive Committee of the ANC, then support for Ramaphosa and funding for the ANC will be stopped immediately. The power is in the money, the power is in the funding, and the influence wielded by the ultra rich. That is how they allegedly gain a foothold over your government. This is how they allegedly gain a foothold over governments on various states worldwide. And you'll see this is not a new tactic. It's used everywhere and in every era. Mahashule was not the only target in the firing line. Those identified as the fight back faction and the supporters of former President Jacob Zuma were expected to be dealt with and expelled from the ANC. Most people who make donations to political parties do this because they share the same political views or they stand to gain a lot if the party comes to power and the party starts placing their own policies. There is an article that was released by Business Day Live back in 2021 that says the brothers-in-law Ramaphosa and Mutsipe donated 6 million rands to ANC ahead of the elections. They say this was info given by the IEC. The Political Funding Act requires that cash donations and those made in kind that are above 100,000 rand by a single donor to a single party in a financial year should be declared. It also stipulates that no donations greater than 15 million rands in a year can be made by a donor to a political party. Apparently back in 2021, the ANC was facing crippling financial problems which is quite surprising to me. They were failing to pay salary for their workers and they were failing to meet obligations for the workers medical aid and pension funds. It states that they struggled to print election posters as well for a period in time but Mutsipe's African Rainbow Minerals donated 5.8 million rands on September 9. Ramaphosa personally made two separate donations of 166,000 rand and 200,000 rand on August 30. The report revealed that the ANC's biggest donor was the Chancellor House Trust which does business on the behalf of the party and donated 15 million rands on August 31st. A company identified as NEP Consulting chipped in 1 million rands on September 3rd and a businessman known as Cedric Ndombela donated 400,000 rands on August 18th, putting the ANC's total to a massive 22.6 million rands in monetary donations, which I honestly believe is a deflated amount, but hey, that's just my personal opinion. It's not like I can oppose a report sent by the IEC, but either way, it's still a massive amount. The Democratic Alliance received a total 
total of 16.8 million rands in donations over the same period of time, while Herman Mashaba's Action SA received donations slightly greater than the DA, which is quite surprising because their party just came to light very recently. Amongst his major donors was Rebecca Oppenheimer, who gave the party 3.3 million rands on September 16. In the previous quarter, her mother Mary Oppenheimer donated 15 million rands to the DA. The same name rings a bell, right? For those who don't know, that is Nikki Oppenheimer's family. Nikki Oppenheimer is the second richest man in South Africa and one of the top five richest people in Africa. He isn't as public as Johan Rupert about his political views, but his family has a history of allegedly meddling in South African politics in the distant past though, I'm not sure about recent times, but I have my suspicions though. Let's take a look at this African-based Oppenheimer family. The Oppenheimer family are one of South Africa's wealthiest families, a wealth built on gold and diamond mining. Ernest Oppenheimer established the Anglo-American Mining Company in 1917 and you can't be living in South Africa and tell me you've never seen the name Anglo America or you've never seen the logo in your life. In 1917 they launched the Anglo American Corporation with financial assistance from another very historically shrewd businessman who goes by the name of John Pierpont Morgan or famously known as JP Morgan. Yes, he's the man who created the biggest bank in the world right now based on market cap JP Morgan Chase, if, if you still can't get the hint from his name. The initial capital that Ernest Oppenheimer was given was one million pounds. Half of the capital was in the United States and half was in, the, was in South Africa and in India. In 1919, two years after its launch, Anglo America purchased diamond mines in Southwest Africa, which would pose a challenge to the De Beers Diamonds business monopoly. De Beers was created by another famous name, Cecil Rowe. Oppenheimer took part in the 1924 South African general election and was elected in the House of Assembly as a member of Kimberley. He held the seat until 1938. Hold that timeline in your minds cause hey, it's a to get hectic. In 1927, Oppenheimer managed to get control of the De Beers empire and consolidated the company's global monopoly over the world's diamond industry until his retirement. He managed to finally get control during a time period when he was heavily involved in politics, which gave him an edge over the power that De Beers years head as a company. Over the course of his chairmanship, Oppenheimer was involved in a number of controversies, including price fixing, antitrust behavior, and allegations of not releasing industrial diamonds for the US effort during World War II. Ernest Oppenheimer was heavily involved in South African politics, but it was in a very direct manner. It wasn't like the stealth or shadowy politics you see nowadays because he had a massive amount of wealth and his political term helped him gain an edge over the De Beers empire so he can create his own monopoly, basically using politics to build your empire but those are just allegations. His tactics are very similar to those that JP Morgan used in the United States which led to him having unbelievable influence over the United States government. This is the history of the Nikki Oppenheimer family that really caught my attention. The ultra wealthy always find a way to meggle around with politics. Whether it's in the shadows or in public like Bill Gates, they will never miss an opportunity to gain an advantage over their competitors and set policies in motion that will favor their ascension or favor their monopolistic behaviors. This is just my own opinion of plutocrats as a whole. Not anyone in particular until they literally get caught and exposed publicly. You guys put the doors together as I bring them to you. The ultra rich have so much influence that they can literally cripple a country's economy like what George Soros did to the United Kingdom. Controlling politics and policy making allows the ultra rich to easily gain more wealth over time or to maintain their wealth. This explains the massive wealth gap here in South Africa. South Africa has a lot of wealthy individuals who are based in Africa. Here's a list of African countries by the the number of millionaires in each country. South Africa is in first place with 37,800 millionaires. Second place is Egypt with 16,100 millionaires. Half the number of millionaires in South Africa. Egypt literally has half the number of millionaires in South Africa. But despite all of this, we still have the biggest wealth gap in the entire world. Yes, we are literally in first place in that statistic. We have the highest concentration of wealthy individuals in the entire continent, yet we have so much poverty that 90% of the wealth in South Africa is held by less than 5% of the population. In 2019, Credit Suisse released a data that revealed an elite group of around 376,000 people based on the adult population of 37.6 million at the time controlled around $311 billion of South Africa's total wealth. Quite shocking, honestly. Breaking down the Credit Suisse data, it's apparent that South Africa's wealth is highly concentrated amongst the super rich. Approximately 80% of the total wealth is held by 10% of the adult population, but the biggest chunk of the money is held by 
the top 1%. Looking at the balance, the remaining 90% of the population controls only 20% of the country's wealth and has a wealth per adult figure of around $4,500. If I'm not mistaken, that's around 80,000 rand. This aligns with the Credit Suisse data which records that the median wealth per adult in South Africa is around $4,523. And I know this might sound like jargon, but if I may put this in simple terms for all of you to actually understand, right? this basically means that the wealth is getting more concentrated at the top and the rest of South Africa is getting even more poor as time goes by. This makes our country or South Africa the most unequal country in the whole world. The World Bank also says that there is an even distribution of agricultural land and its effect at driving inequality, especially in rural areas. This is also an issue in Namibia where 70% of the 98.1 million acres of commercial agricultural land still belongs to the Namibians of European descent. This is a matter that is famously known from Julius Malema and many people were bashing him but he was actually speaking facts and statistics. For the first time they took a political stand and attacked a political formation was when the youth league spoke about land expropriation without compensation and nationalization. And when we went aggressively to get the ANC to agree in the NGC of the ANC, he then realized that this is becoming a reality and said the youth league is like an irritating mosquito in a tent and it needs There is this computer game that I used to play called Plutocracy. What basically happens in this game is you start with a small amount of around $100,000 to $200,000 back in the Carnegie and Rockefeller days. What I had to do is use that money to buy shares from different companies ranging from industries like oil refinery and the railway industry. You know those were the industries that started booming during those decades. So what I would do in that game is buy shares from companies with low market cap but high profitability. Even though I didn't even know what market cap was until I continued playing the game for a long period of time. What would happen is over the months the companies would rise in market value and thus also increasing the value of my shares in the company until I eventually bought out more than 51% of the shares in the company so I can have a controlling stake. So let's say now I have a controlling stake at the company right and I can now create company policies. What I would do is bribe officials and corrupt them from the police chief to the mayor and once I have bribed the mayor he would be very favorable towards me and give me every government tender or every government contract that comes around and those tenders and contracts would skyrocket the company's revenue tenfold. This game basically taught me how plutocrats basically behave and manipulate politics in different states and nations. When I was playing the game, it gave me an attitude of greed. You become addicted to the high revenue that comes with these government contracts. There is nothing more lucrative than a government contract. Whenever the tender contract expired, I would immediately get to bribing the new mayor as well because I would want to get back to making that big revenue again. Okay? Basically, it becomes a dopamine effect. We live in an unfair world when it comes to the imbalance in world. The poor will always bear the burden for the sake of the rich gaining more wealth. Most billionaires do this thing called stealth politics or pushing their policies in the background without having to join political parties and all that kind of stuff. They allegedly move in the shadows. The main reason billionaires practice stealth politics is that taken collectively, their political preferences do not align with what the majority of the citizens want. Their near total silence on issues like taxes and social security is usually on purpose, probably caused mainly by a desire to avoid arousing the public concerning their unpopular political opinions. This makes it easier for them to avoid being held accountable. Look at what happened to Bill Gates when he started pushing the jab, right? People were bashing him worldwide. And even to this day, people still have a sour taste towards Bill Gates as compared to someone like Elon Musk. In the United States, 40% of all political donations come from the 1% of the 1%, basically the elite of the elite. Though the billionaires barely showed up in the public records talking about taxes, it was still possible to connect their sizable contributions to ideological political action committees and to the candidate who supported issues like tax cuts for the wealth, privatization of social security, reduced social spending and abolishing the estate tax. What we see is basically a class of people who have more money than you can imagine. People who are very politically active in very hidden ways and who I have reasons to believe have been politically influential and have used their political influence in ways that don't really serve the interests or the preference of what most citizens want. The reason why I tell you about how the rich affect politics in America is because we use that to draw very close parallels to what happens here in South Africa. There isn't much of a difference with the forces acting in the shadows here in South Africa as well. As the virus spread back in 2020, central banks injected $9 trillion into economies worldwide, aiming to keep the world economy afloat.
much of that stimulus has gone into financial markets and from there on into the net worth of the ultra rich. The total wealth of billionaires around the world rose from $5 trillion to $13 trillion in 12 months. This has officially gone down as the most dramatic rise ever registered on an annual billionaire list compiled by the Forbes magazine. On the 2021 billionaires list compiled by Forbes, billionaires rose by nearly 700 to a record total of more than 2,500. The biggest rise came in China which added 238 billionaires that's approximately one billionaire every 36 hours, literally. Next came the United States which added 110 billionaires. Elon Musk went from being worth $25 billion, hear this, to a staggering $150 billion in the same period of time. Much of the stealth politics practiced by America's ultra rich is happening at the state and local levels where many crucial pocketbook issues are decided often outside the scrutiny of the national media. But here in South Africa, the ultra rich have no choice but to deal directly with the national government officials because that's the body that holds the power to set policies in our country. This is exactly why you heard allegations from Zuma and Malema saying Johan Rupert and company have been heavily involved in the politics of the and therefore they are not going to like me but I've behaved for decades I've not played around with intelligence information. Because they stand to lose a lot if the country falls into turmoil, and they also stand to gain a lot in the case that some policies can be set in motion that favor their desires, like issues concerning trust funds and pension funds. Even I would have messed around with politics if I was as rich as these guys, because my business empire would be directly impacted by the decisions made at a political level. All this political dancing by the ultra-rich mirrors exactly what I was doing on the plutocracy business simulation game. During the state capture, Jacob Zuma literally allowed that Johan Rupert threatened to crush the country's economy. Yes, you heard that right. Threatened to crush the country's economy if Zuma didn't immediately fire Ace Mahashul. And he says they actually shook the economy to an extent when the president didn't obey their orders. If Zuma takes out a, a remove a Pravin quarter, would shut down the economy of this country. We must go and tell him. This reminds me of the recent battle between the United States Governor Ron DeSantis and the company Disney. Governor DeSantis made waves for going against Disney with a desire to tax them for the massive land they own in his state. This is an example of what happens to a company when a government that doesn't like the company comes to power. It shakes the company's revenue, so hence why big companies and individuals invest heavily in a candidate that best suits their interests. If you have seen the series Spartacus, then you know of a wealthy businessman known as Marcus Crassus. He was the wealthiest man in Rome during the times of Pompey Magnus, Spartacus and the early days of Julius Caesar before he went on to conquer Gaul. Gaul is basically the region around France and those areas. Marcus Crassus used his enormous wealth to gain influence in the Senate and eventually stood toe to toe with, with a conqueror like Pompey Magnus and a politically shrewd Julius Caesar. So since ancient times, wealth always influences politics because the wealthy can easily be affected if the government in charge does not like their ideas or does not like the, uh, the massive wealth gap in society. Like how Malema doesn't like it, right? So if Malema came to power, it would be a disadvantage for most of these wealthy individuals. That's why he doesn't have those kind of donors. The reason why most billionaires would oppose throwing other African nationals out of the country is because usually foreigners are a source of cheap labor because of the levels of desperation compared to the people born in the country. Look at what is happening in Dubai. Foreign nationals are used as a source of cheap labor and you hear so many stories of people disappearing after going to Dubai looking for employment and how they confiscate your passport the moment you go there to get a job or the moment you go there to start working in Dubai, you are a source of cheap and desperate labor, which usually accomplishes projects more fluently. Another great example is what happened to the Israelites when they became captives and slaves in Egypt. They were used as cheap labor to build the projects that the Pharaoh wanted to build. If South Africa was to only have South Africans working, then these wealthy individuals are bound to take losses in the wages department. Because obviously we won't offer cheap labor as time goes on. We would actually demand an increase in salaries and these businesses don't want that. And I personally also wouldn't have wanted the same thing. During my research on Johan Rupert, I ran into a lot of intriguing information and allegations about him. In 1966, he was interviewed by a journalist in Stellenbosch, and he said the fortunes of white and black people in South Africa were linked together, or they were intertwined. His exact words were, if the African doesn't eat, we won't sleep. If it doesn't succeed, we won't succeed. And if we don't succeed, then he won't succeed as well. As his business empire grew and his interests expanded beyond South Africa's borders, Rupert took on a more public role and became increasingly vocal about the apartheid 
state regime, describing it as a system founded on white fears, which he felt was unsustainable. Johann Rupert has always considered himself an opponent of apartheid, or so he says, or so a lot of articles have said. He was actually ejected from training in the Navy during his military conscription when it came to light that he had taken part in producing an anti-apartheid edition of the student newspaper at Stellenbosch University sometime around October 1970. In 1973, he struck up a relationship with Steve Biko. Apparently, Rupert's dislike of politicians and the apartheid government intensified during his time when he worked at the Chase Manhattan Bank in 1974. David Rockefeller called him into the office one day to ask him what was happening in the borders of Southwest Africa and Angola. You know, when you hear the name Rockefeller, then you are dealing with truly the hidden side of wealth in the world. To find out what was happening in the situation, Rupert called his father, who in turn called Hilgard Muller, then Minister of Foreign Affairs. Hilgard Muller assured Anton Rupert that South Africa was not in Angola, all because they feared losing a big credit. This is the kind of power wealthy individuals can wield over a government. The Rupert father and son were the connection to the country's biggest creditor at the time. The wealthy individuals in a country have so much influence that even the Minister of Foreign Affairs has to explain himself because those creditors can stop funding the regime. In March 2011, McDonald's allegedly sold its South African operations to the one and only Cyril Ramaphosa. The deal granted Ramaphosa 20-year control of the fast food giant South African operation, including the exclusive power to lease out real estate to its over 130 outlets spreading throughout the country. Ever since McDonald's launched its operations in South Africa in 1995, it struggled against intense competition from homegrown food companies like Xtiers, Wimpy, and Debonair's Pizza. He held McDonald's until he had to sell it in order to avoid complications with his political ambition, the time when he started becoming vice president and eventually the president. Ramaphosa first caught the attention of the Forbes magazine in 1998 when he appeared on the list of heavy hitters with a net worth of $25 million at the time. He was an executive deputy chairman of Nail, the largest black-led business group with $2.1 billion of assets, and he was the acting chairman of the beer giant South African breweries and director at Nicky Oppenheimer's mining group Anglo America. Yes. Ramaphosa worked for Nikki Oppenheim. Two years later, in 2000, he set up Shanduka Group, which is now a leading African black-owned and managed investment holdings company, established with investments cutting across natural resources, financial services, property, energy, beverages, and telecom. The company was majorly controlled by the Ramaphosa Family Trust, now has investments apparently worth close to a billion dollars. Apart from serving as an executive chairman of the Shanduka Group, Cyril Ramaphosa was also an executive chairman of MTN Group and Mondi PLC and he sat on the board of Standard Bank Group and Coca-Cola's International Public Policy Advisory Board and the Commonwealth Business Council. He's a business icon in this regard. A key reason why Malema won't easily become president is the fact that he doesn't have the support from these big white billionaire donors who allegedly have the ability to control media and sway public opinion. As sad as it is to admit, it clearly seems like the ANC might actually win the next election again because of the level of support and backing the party actually has. It's really unbelievable. The closest is probably action essay but they are still new so we don't know what to expect the Muzibe family is another hidden titan that works without having much criticism as compared to the Ruperts and the Oppenheimers because they are black Patrice Muzibe is the head of CAF the leading body in African football his brother-in-law is the president of the country his wife was or still is the head of the University of Cape Town last time I checked another brother-in-law who has and he also has another brother-in-law who has held a huge position in ANC this family has such a long web that is truly scary. Someone on the inside was quoted saying, we have lost the ANC to those who refuse to transform the country. We are no longer in control as they call the shots. White monopoly capital has taken over. 